Uh, hi everyone. Today I will talk about Linux plumbing. It's a wide subject and includes uh, shell redirection, but also network redirection and how to pipe one thing to the other. Uh, so a, a little basics here to start. In a shell, we have two streams output, basically std out and std r with symbol uh, greater than for std out and two greater than for std r. You can redirect one into the other using um, the ampersand character to just give the name of the stream. So if you just redirect one to the other, you end up with a single stream in the output and you can't unmerge them later. Uh, if you are curious about the two, you can actually write the std out sign with a one behind uh, before. And if it makes more sense for you, you can write it, but the standard way is just to write a single character. We have a, a special device named slash dev slash null that could be used to send any data in it and it totally discard. So if you don't know uh, what to do of your STDR, you can just pipe it to dev null and it will be discarded and not saved on disk. And if you redirect um, your stream with a single character, it will create a file if the target doesn't exist, or it will just erase all the content and start writing in it. If you use twice the sign, it will be used to happen the content. So this is for output streams only in your shell. Now we will talk about input stream, uh, which is often used with a pipe to link command together. And the input is named std in for standard input. And you just write your command pipe second command. Uh, it's important to know a pipe as a buffer. So if your first command is sending data to the second one, but the second one is slower, the first command will just stop until the buffer is uh, have some room again to write a new block. You can tweak the buffer size on Linux uh, globally with the according file in slash proc, but the process itself could uh, make a system call to change its uh, STD in buffer size. It's important to remember STD error doesn't go in the pipe. So if you pipe two command, you will have uh, command two output displayed, not command one, but you will have the std error of command one and command two. And you can use the um, list then uh, character to just pipe a file content as std in for a command. And it's the same as using cat the file pipe a command. And on and bash and ZSH and maybe some other shell, but it's still not POSIX compliant. You can use free time, the list van character and a string, and it will be used as STD in, in the standard input. It's the same as using echo hello world pipe command one. So from there, uh, we can know Look, we can look at uh, a few commands you may find useful if you want to alterate a pipe or a pipeline. Uh, the first one I like is named PV. Um, it's the name for pipe visualize, visualize. And it can be used to just display how much time data passed through the pipe, uh, how many data, uh, at which speed. 
but it can also affect uh, the content within the pipe uh, in terms of uh, flow output or just showing how many lines per second are displayed. So the first example, uh, PV-L, and a log file will just display the content of the file on std out. It's why it's piped to dev null. But on std error, uh, PV will just display a progress bar with your um, line per second. So this command can be useful if you want to know how many entries do I have per second in my log file. And actually, I think I can make a short demo. Uh, if I at the random, it's displaying a lot of things. But at which rate? So uh, we see the first number here is the number of lines that went through PV and then the time and the rate of lines per second I'm generating. Uh, it's not very interesting to look at uh, random strings going by, but you get the idea of why you may want to use PV. And if I don't use the line mode, it will just display the rate. So um, 360 megabytes per second of random data. And now I could just use this to limit the rate at 10 megabytes of data per second. And now we can just look each second we have in the first colon uh, plus 10 megabytes. So it's working exactly as we expect. Uh, I have a real world use case for this later, I think. Uh, the second command is called mbuffer and with it you can add it into a pipe and it will take as much as data as you allow it to retain and continuously send it through the next pipe. Uh, that's why it's called mbuffer. So by default the Linux buffer is one megabyte uh, which can be not great if your first command is blocked, but is blocking like a database, but the second command isn't eating as much as data as the first output. So you may want to use mbuffer in between to just hold data as much as possible to unlock the first command and let the second, the next command eat um, as, just has its space. Um, in the second example here, we can also use mbuffer to redirect the stream to TCP host. Uh, in this example, it will redirect command one output to host one and host two on TCP port 2000. It's a bit stretch use case, but it's supported by mbuffer and I thought it's very cool because you don't have many ways to duplicate a stream if you want to send it over network. And another cool command, which is a lot more conventional, is T. It just takes data on its standard input and it will copy on its standard output, but it will also copy it in between. So it's a bit like a T because it takes one from one way to the other, but just redirect a copy somewhere else. Uh, you may want to use it to record command one output in a log file somewhere, but we also have very nice uh, special device like slash dev slash stdr, which will make write command one and std out, but on your std error. Basically, with this, you can inspect uh, the command one output without affecting the pipe, because um, command one output would still be relayed to command two, 
but it can be displayed on your screen. You can make a, a small example here. So let's say I want the main page of WC and maybe to WC. And okay, cool. I know there is uh, 77 lines, uh, but I'm not sure it's piping the right thing in it. So I would like to inspect what, what's getting in it. So I just had TDEV STDR in it. And the last line is still exact, the exact same output of my command without T, but I also had all the main page of WC. So it's very practical if you want to inspect what's going on in between your commands and monitor if it's going fine, if you have a very big command. Um, now we have basics for shared road direction. We will talk a bit about network, but because it's a lot more interesting. Uh, network 101, we will uh, just as a rem remember for everyone, we have a, a few stacks uh, taking the next stack in this model. We have the IP stack. Uh, which interests us and the TCP stack here. And on top of it, you have like HTTP or HTTPS. Uh, it's all in this layer. And we will see how to manipulate data to be piped to TCP or just talk HTTP uh, to a remote server. <clears throat> So if you want from your shell to reach network, but at um, the TCP level, uh, a good tool for this is Netcat. There is a two or three Netcat implementation. So the most interesting I think is OpenBSD Netcat. It can do TLS and it has a lot of option, but the one from Linux toolchain should also be doing the job. Uh, so with Netcat, you can listen on a TCP socket and just take the output to another command. And you can pipe a command to a TCP port. So I have my, termi my terminal here with two users. So there are two local users. I didn't want to make it complicated for me. Uh, the remote users will be using Netcat and uh, listen on the TCP port 2000. And this user will be saying, hello world and send it on localhost on TCP port 2000. And you see the remote user received my message. So I just basically piped uh, my shell command output over the network to another shell. And it's pretty fun. You can do many things like I can type data in it. Uh, Let's send this. Basically, tar is making a tarball of all your file into a single file. And I will send it over localhost to the next user. And it will be untarred. It should work. Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell what to tell. Oh, that's it. Uh, I moved. But in the directory, so you have all my previous knowledge sharing directories in this user base directory. But I, I just moved all things over the network and 
not encrypted, but it wasn't localized, so it's okay. So don't do this over the internet, it's pretty bad. But you get the idea of just using Netcat to, to connect to a service and pipe data to it. We have another command, which is more complicated and complete. It's named SOCAT. And it can basically take anything, any kind of input to any kind of output. And in my example, I will use it for listening on a Unix socket. And while a TCP socket is for networking, a Unix socket is a file on the system, and it can be used to communicate between uh, processes or users. Uh, most of the time, like if you have a database or um, some services like PHP, FPM, they will listen on a Unix socket and communicate with the web server or with an application over that socket. It's much more secure and TCP because it doesn't involve network. And it's a lot more faster because it's not network. It's just two processes talking to each other inside the same system. I think I don't have it installed globally. So in this example, I will create a file named tmp slash unix. And it must be written right up by uh, all user on the system. And be displayed on std out. So the first parameter is the the out, the out input, and the second one, the output. I can check here. There is a, a specific file named TMP Unix. The first character of LS output is an S because it's a socket. And now I can open it with netcat, but in Unix mode with the capital U. And now I'm connected to the other through the, the socket file, and I can just write hello world. Oh, both are not connect, and I can communicate from one user to the other. And it's working fine. When I exit the socket, uh, socket also exits because it wasn't computer to to re-listen re after a connection. But I can also use this if I want to use pipe. And it's working as well as the example before with NC over CP. Netcat can also listen on your Unix socket, but it doesn't change the mode of the file and it wasn't as great as SOCAT for this example. And SOCAT is much more complete than NETCAT. It was, it was worth mentioning it. Um, another tool to just connect shells and network is INETD or XINETD or even systemd listening services. Um, I won't make demo of them. It's nice to know they exist. Uh, InetD isn't, it's quite obsolete by now because it was easy to make the service down. And I will explain the reason. So InetD or systemd listening will just wait on a TCP port or UDP, but most often on TCP. And when you connect, on this port, they run a binary or a shell command. And the input from the network becomes the std in of the binary. And what the bin binary display on the terminal becomes the uh, network output. So you can basically turn any binary into a web service. 
uh, unfortunately, it costs a lot in terms of system calls because NAD has to fork and create a new process and it costs a lot for a system. So if you just connect 20 uh, clients per second, your system may go down and it's finished for the server. So it's not very really, really secure or reliable because it's super easy to get that kind of server down, but internally it can make sense to make this because it's easy to run sandbox and secure small binaries because you don't really have to take uh, care of the network. But at the same time, it's super easy to make a, a denial of service. So it used to be very popular, but nowadays it's not very useful. Um, let's see a real world example I used 10 years ago in a previous company. Uh, I worked there as a sysadmin and we had a lot of database and on remote data centers and developers liked to have them local, locally for working with data. So the problem is we need to dump a database from a remote server from production and it must be as fast as possible because dumping a database can lock tables and make this website unresponsive, but we need to make it as small as possible on the network. So we won't be, the network won't be a bottleneck and it will cost less in terms of network. And we want to restore it on the local server at the same time. But we also want to make a copy of the dump. So if we need it five minutes later, uh, we don't have to go on the production server and go through the network and do all of this. And the super common I came with is this one. So basically, if you take a look at the first line, it's doing a SSH on the database server to run pg dump uh, my base, which basically tell PostgreSQL to dump that database. And it's pipe through JZIP uh, with some flags to tell it, okay, you can send the compressed output on STD out. It's fine. I agree with this. And all of this is sent. And then we continue to pipe it, but it's now on the local machine. So the remote server will dump the database and compress it and then send it through SSH. Then we unzip it and use T to create the dump on the local system. And also had an M buffer here to take as much as possible, uh, as data as possible to uh, prevent the dump to have to wait because pitch dump is um, freezing the database, which is terrible in production. And then uh, after PG dump, we can just restore it slowly on the development server, which wasn't super fast. And this was like working very well. And because of the T, just in one operation, we just had um, a save of the database for further reuse instead of having to do a PG dump again. And that's where I've discovered about mBuffer because it was very handy uh, prior to using it. We had to wait uh, the rest of the process to end for the PG dump to end. And it wasn't ideal. Uh, now let's have fun redirect redirecting streams. Um, here we, I will use Socket to expose my local TCP port 2000 and redirect everything going through it to uh, my website on HTTPS and see how it's going. So I create an input on TCP on port 2000 
Um, everything going in this will go in webdesign.mixos.cafe on for uh, HTTPS for its waiting. And now I can use curl and with the dash k to not care about the uh, TLS certificate because I'm asking for the website localhost on port 2000. Um, obviously, I don't have a certificate for localhost. And it did something, but it didn't display the website uh, on website.nixos.cafe. Uh, it's just my default page if you ask for a virtual host that isn't support. So we can just reopen it again. But now I can tell Curl to let us the host website.nixwave.cafe. So it's doing the same request except it's adding a header, a HTTP header telling I want this host to be displayed. And we have something like looking like a HTML and some nicks here and there. So it's working. So in fact, I create just a HTTP proxy, just redirecting HTTP request to a HTTPS server. If you want to redirect streams like this, but uh, on a more on a better level, you can use Nginx and um, its stream mode. Uh, with the stream mode, it can just accept TCP in input and redirect it to somewhere else. Or you can use HA proxy. Uh, so both can work at TCP level or HTTP. Uh, basically, uh, an example of this is I used to stream uh, video games from my computer and I was streaming to my Nginx proxy with the stream mode and it was saving the video file somewhere on the system and then it was, it was relaying to Twitch and YouTube at the same time and, and I couldn't do this on my single uh, computer. So this is a kind of redirection you can do with Nginx or HA proxy. Of course, on HTTP level, it's something uh, we do it almost, almost every day, like creating virtual host. And just if you ask this virtual host, you end up on the right service, service. or making proxy. Um, yes, uh, HTTP proxy for reverse proxying. Uh, but you can also use those services to add a TLS layer to anything behind. behind. Uh, if you make a simple network service, but you don't want to take care of handling TLS network workload, just to, it's adding more work for you and you may do it wrong. You could use Nginx to proxy your network application but handle the TLS part on the public side. Uh, let's go for some interactive TCP. And I will introduce a new tool called Telnet. And Telnet is a very, very old tool. It connects, it used to connect, connect uh, to be used to connect to computers using a circle cable and it, it was used before SSH and it wasn't secure at all because everything was plain text. Um, but Telnet is just opening uh, a TCP socket and let you type things to it. That's just what it does. So if I uh, Use Telnet to connect to my web server on port 80, which I forgot in the slide. 
uh, it's connecting to the web server on HTTP. And then they can just add, uh, give me the, the roots file. And I'm using HTTP 1.0. I can type all the other, um, headers here. And after two new lines, or just an empty line after the headers, it's considering I'm done with my request and will give me the output. So what happened here is after my request here, the server starts responding and NDX gave me all the headers of the response and then the content here. Uh, it's not exactly what I expected because I want my web design to be displayed. So we need to add a few things. Like I want the index of the website, but it's the host website.nixos.cafe. Now I have a different reply and it's telling me uh, it, it has moved. And it has moved to HTTPS webline.nixos.cafe. But we have an issue. Uh, Wait, that... what happened with the host? So you add the host, but it already knows about that because that's what you connected to. Oh, um, yeah, in my previous example, I'm requesting, um, I was requesting the website webline.nixos.cafe, but through a local proxy. Um, this, web, <coughs> this website exists, but if I ask it here, the web server doesn't know I am asking for website.nixos.cafe because it, I use the name um, website.nixos.cafe to connect, but Telnet don't relay this information just connecting to an IP and the web server doesn't know for which website I'm connecting. And this is why we have this header for HTTP name host. And we can tell, I want this website on your web server. And then I validate my um, request and I get a reply that Uh, Website.nixos.cafe has moved to HTTPS and because I connected to HTTP. And if I don't give the host value, I get a different answer because for unknown host asked on this server, this will just reply this string. Oh, so you're oh, getting just, to the server, but it doesn't know, like there could be multiple hosts on the same server. Yes. Okay. By default, if you use curl like this, it has some clever code inside to reduce the URL as a host uh, header. If I use this and discard the output, yeah, of course, it's not displaying anything. If I look at the header sent by curl in this, um, no, it's not doing what I want. Wait, what's the minus i? Uh, I would like it to show the headers used to connect. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, right. So. Here it's connecting. Um, it's doing a head command instead of get because I used the capital I, which I can just discard because I want it V. And we see curl is doing uh, quite the same except using HTTP 1.1, and it has to define the host in the HTTP request. Because oh, okay. it, yeah. it can just figure if I'm using this URL, 
it's mostly the same host I want. But you can override this by saying, I want hello world. And then if you have a different reply, you have the default uh, virtual host replying. Is it clear now? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Cool. Uh, so yeah, we were talking about HTTP and now explaining me, it moved to HTTPS, sorry. And telnet only talk clear text and can't make a TLS end check on the HTTPS server. So instead of telnet, we can use OpenSSL here uh, to act like a telnet, but who can speak TLS. So I need open TLS, uh, open SSL in my shell. So I never remember this command. Uh, so it's looking fine. So it will connect to the host on the on poor HTTPS and display a lot of things about the um, certificate. And then I can make my HTTP request. And it's displaying the same because I didn't give a host name. And now we have uh, the content of the website on HTTPS, but by hand. So if you need to talk uh, manually to a TLS service, you need to use OpenSSL as client. And finally, uh, we will connect on IRC, which is uh, chat protocol and it's so easy to use. I can do it by hand with telnet and chat with people. I need to connect uh, yeah, to a port. I forgot the port in all my um, <laughs> signs. I need to wait a bit for the protocol. So instead of using an IRC client, uh, I am the client and I do what an IRC client would do. So my name is Solen underscore. I need to put two things here, a uh, description. My name is Solen underscore on the server. And now I could join maybe uh, NixOS. No, because I would need to be registered. Uh, maybe Ubuntu. Yes, so I joined Ubuntu, it's telling me a lot of things and it's mostly all the users in the channel. And I could just use print msg Ubuntu and some text to send it to the channel, but I won't because it would be mostly spam and I don't have much things to say. But I can also join another channel, like a uh, random channel here. And there is nobody in this channel. And I can write with it, uh, to it with prive msg and the channel name. Basically, if you are in random channel here, you would receive a reward from me. And if I want to write to someone uh, like myself, instead of using the hashtag that define a channel, I don't use it. Um, I saw I received a message from Solène um, saying hello. So I talk to myself. Um, that's basically all you need to know to create an IRC client. And the other thing is there is a, a simple protocol to 
check if your client is still alive. And sometimes the server will make a pong request and you need to reply ping and the server you are connecting to. So I can just initiate it and make a ping and the server is replaying pong. So it's telling me I'm still alive, you are still alive, so your connection won't be closed. And I can just type help because the protocol just handle it. And I can use quite to quite. And that's all for today. Thank you, Solen. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah, uh, I saw Johan said you can type data to SSH2, uh, which is very practical. And I encourage you to use SSH instead of Netcat if you need to communicate from one system to the other. But that Netcat can be used to pipe to almost anything, just not uh, from one user to another. Uh, I don't think there is uh, the, that sign with two lists um, because it doesn't make sense to happen input to something you start. Maybe it exists. Uh, we just check. Oh, yeah, you can use it uh, for the cat example. So it's taking input as long as you make the, the bomb. So in the cat example, I, I wanted to talk about it, but I wasn't sure it was uh, useful. Uh, with the cat and two character, you put a bomb, so usually it's EOF, but you can just say foobar. Um, while there, you can just type anything. And until you type your bomb, so EOF or foobar, um, it will take it as input. And then you can pipe it to, to something else. But if you pipe, it's not very, I'm writing an example. it's not uh, straightforward because you need to make it on the first line. So if, we, if you don't have any more questions, I think we can get a cup of tea. Excellent idea. <laughs> well, thanks, Salen, uh, for this uh, presentation. There's a lot of uh, information here. I think I'll have to rewatch it uh, again <laughs> to remember everything. Uh, but yeah, it was very interesting. And as usual, if uh, anyone comes up with a question, post it in the channel. And I'm sure Salen will answer it. Um, with that, uh, thanks again. and. Talk to you next week. See you. Thanks, Alan. Thank you so much.